Guys, heavy things lightly. This is Solo Pod. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Or is it? This is episode two. This is First Things Foundation, Heavy Things Lightly, our podcast. Go check us out, www.first-things.org. I can't wait for this pod. And to see Greg Gilbertson. You hear the music? That's written and produced by Greg. We're doing a gig December 2nd up in Wisconsin. Yeah, with a guy named Joe Pug, too. Yeah, and Vesper Stamper. It's going to be fun. Let's get started. I'm calling this part of the pod, the solo four-part series, Earth to CERN, we have an inshallah problem. How the old world is perplexed by CERN. So in the first episode, you, you started to hear about the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That doesn't feel Christian or old? Is it, is it new? And we found out a lot about, well, about where that phrase comes from. It's a very... Uh, it's a very 16th century thing. You don't see it before that. We also talked about Physics Girl. We're going we're gonna to meet Physics Girl right now. She's a, she's a popular YouTuber who does cool physics stuff around the world and also has like millions of followers. Physics Girl, let's just introduce you to Physics Girl. There's a reason that we're watching Physics Girl because she's going on a pilgrimage to one of the holy sites of modern life. So here's Physics Girl. We'll just let her tell you about what she's doing. There's a warehouse in France, right on the Swiss yeah, border, physics, where the girl. most expensive material in the world is yeah, created. Buddy. So Wikipedia seems confident, but I'm not so sure we can even call it material, because it's not mm. made of regular matter. This stuff is the rarest and potentially the most dangerous on Earth. And scientists from around the world are just trying to figure out how to put it in a bottle and carry it across the street. Antimatter. But what is antimatter and why is there so little of it? It's the rarest substance on Earth. It's the rarest substance in the universe. But scientists theorize that the Big Bang should have created a universe with equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And yet we look around and see almost completely matter. Why? That is surprisingly one of the biggest unanswered questions in physics. They're going to dive into it. You know how she's going to do it? She's going to dive into this question about matter of course, by going on a pilgrimage to CERN. Now, you might hear some dripping sarcasm in my voice. Uh, it's possible, whatever. But the largest history experiment in the history of creation and all of humanity, times 400,000 plus 6 times 45,000 divided by 11 multiplied by invisibility times the root of infinity, this is CERN in her world. It's like, Ma! you can go watch the video. We're linking it. Why am I making fun of it? Because the notion that she's not on pilgrimage is psychopathic. If you're like, I don't really think she's on pilgrimage, then you don't know what pilgrimage is or you're psychopathic. Right? You can feel it in every move, every turn, every corner. Right? And here's what's going to happen. As we go through this, these, these four episodes, you're going to see that it's something like seven towers of Babel, plus an Egyptian pyramid and six hanging gardens, but 270 trillion times better. And also about 300 million times more expensive. That's what CERN, the Conseil, the Council for the Research of Nuclear Stuff. Why does CERN exist was the question we asked last pod. And also... Like, what are they doing? And Like, what's the talos? What's the intention? And I'm using her pilgrimage to try to understand our pilgrimage about this phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Somehow they're connected. Last time we got introduced, today we'll go a little deeper. So we'll look at the aphorism and we'll look and see what the old world might make of this aphorism, okay? And we'll try to do this in the context of physics girl. She seems nice. I'm not mad at her. Last time we found out that this proverb, the road to hell is not is, is paved with good intentions, that's not in the Bible. It's really not in the Quran either. It's not vet, some Vedic writing from some old-ass Hindu text. It's not really a thing before the 1500s when we see people like William Tinsdale and John Fox, right? These Christian reformers par excellence, they use it in their writing. Again, check out the last episode. 
All right. But the old world, yeah. <clears throat> Christian and non Christian, well, it's just, this does not resonate. Let's start with John Chrysostom, shall we? He's a famous, man, nah, he's like super famous. He's like almost as famous as Physics Girl. All right. He's, he's a very famous theologian from the East. If you're Orthodox, you know about him, right? He wrote the liturgy of, for Christians that was used and continues to be used, right? Hundreds of millions of them. So here's what he says about good intentions, among other things. You ready? I use my John Chrysostom voice. God shows mercy upon the last and cares for the first. And to the one he gives, and upon the other he bestows gifts. And he both accepts the deeds and welcomes the intention, and honors the acts and praises the offering. Wherefore, enter you all into the joy of our Lord. Oh! Now, some of you are getting a little teary-eyed. I, I am. That's the Paschal homily of St. John Christum. St. John. Where does he get off saying things like, God welcomes your intentions? What? I thought, well, the, the road to hell. Uh-oh. Enter all into the joy of God. Well, it's kind of in the Bible, see, like a lot. In the parable of the talents, there are servants who are entrusted with money while their master is away. When the master returns, the servants are expected to give back the dough along with any additional amount that uh, may have been earned. You know the story. One servant, uh, let's call him the lazy bro, the lazy bro. But he gives back his original offering, but without any extra dough. We'll get back to him in a second. What about the other two? This is interesting to me, the other two. The other two servants both come with the original dough, money, but one gives back an additional five talents. The other gives back an additional 10. Oh, 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 one, I don't know, let's call it doubled, one tripled. So these two are adding some profit into the mix. One more than the other, though. That's important. In the parable, what does the master say to these two? To the guy who gives five times profit and the guy who gives 10 times profit. Here's what the master says to both. Well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. Aha, that's what John Chrysostom is quoting. Both are good. Both are faithful. Both get more stuff. How come they both get equal stuff? That's weird. Or at least how come it appears that both get the same pat on the back? One guy, 10 times more stuff than the other guy. They both get the same blessing, though their outcomes were different. Hmm. Again, it reminds me of what I just quoted from St. John. The master accepts the deeds and welcomes the intention. There's nothing in the parable that says the 10 is better than the five. This is really important. But there is a lot in the parable about the other guy, the servant, the lazy one. That servant, well, he's given, uh, well, he's kind of given, oh, hell. Like, he went into the outer darkness. He was cast into the place where people are gnashing their teeth. I'm telling you, outer darkness teeth gnashers, well, that feels like, that feels like a pretty raw deal for a guy that at least he gave him back the original. Dang, Jesus. Chill out, bro. But why was he sent to hell? Look, I'm not a priest. You don't have to believe me. I don't really care. I think he had really no good intention other than that which served his own desire. God didn't hate the outcome. That he, didn't, right? he didn't hate the outcome. It wasn't like God was like, oh, man, I needed that extra 10 talents. Damn it, how am I going to pay off my debts? God's not like, you needed to bring me more money. God's not like a mafia boss. He's just unimpressed with the lack of intention. The intention is the point. The outcome is not. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Wait a minute. So if I have a really good intention and I, I don't know, my good intention ends up some kid getting hit in the head with a baseball bat because I wanted to build a little baseball field for my, all my little neighbor friends. 
wait, I'm in trouble for that? N not according to this teaching, I'm not. So how does physics girl fit into the gnashing of teeth stuff, right? We saw her on her way to CERN. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. But first, let's just do a little bit more from the old world. I just want to, I want to give you some more and then we'll be done. Okay. It's something like the intentions should be God's intentions. You see this? Let's just take a look at Islam. In Islam, an old world faith. Well, it's one of the newest old world faiths. What do you see? You see this thing, this inshallah problem. Here's what I mean. Inshallah means if God wills it. And if you've been around old world Muslims, they say this all the time. I mean, like all the time, like your baby's dying. Inshallah. Wife runs off with another guy. Eh, inshallah. The Mets, they might win the East. Inshallah. It's a lot. And when you hear it, it can mean, well, for less than pious Muslim, it can mean nothing to see here, just adding some sounds. <laughs> I'm not even thinking about it. But often, especially in more traditional societies, it actually is an answer to the problem. Like, like really, it's the point. Right? Here's an explanation from an actual old world Muslim professor in Islamic studies. He says, we say inshallah because Allah commanded Prophet Muhammad to say, and never say anything like, indeed, I will do that tomorrow. Never say anything like, indeed, I will do that tomorrow, unless you add, if God wills it. If God wills it. Then you can say, I'll try to do that tomorrow. Eh, it's not on us. God will do as he sees fit according to his divine providence and his love for us. How about that? That's from the professor. In this particular tradition, your intention is played down because your intention is less important than God's will. You don't matter so much. God sort of allows it or he doesn't. The key is that you are not in charge. Now, I'm not saying you got to agree with this. This is a Muslim peace day, a way of knowing, right? You should intend to remember that the intention should be to remember that you are not in charge. That's sort of old world Islam. The intention of the old world was something like making God's intention your own. What about pagans, though? What about like Romans and Greeks? Well, first and foremost, these supposedly rational people. I mean, look, I get it. Our American, our American story is that we picked up on these very rational Greeks and, and Romans. Uh -huh. uh, let's just say the Greeks and Romans both loved them some auguries. Do you know this term? Soothsaying. Um, diviners. Rome had official diviners, like a committee, in fact. They were called the Collegium of Haru Species. Yeah, I'm saying it right. Haru species. The, the This Collegium, was their duty was to observe signs such as the flight of birds and then interpret them a, fl a flight of birds went one way well that was a series of unusual events such as the birth of a two-headed calf oh the birds are flying this way two-headed calf oh we got oh we're being told a lot right here pay attention right on the capitoline hill the eating habits of a group of sacred chickens well they were open to interpretation by the diviners if they refused to eat at all, the chickens, that is, that meant an ill omen day. Roman armies, this is true, went on campaigns and took sacred chickens with them. And they would watch how they ate so they knew when to attack. I know. It seems like I'm making this up. And I'm making this up. Good intentions pave the way to hell. But wait. It doesn't seem like the intentions matter much at all. It seems like the good intentions were second fiddle to reading chicken habits, right? There wasn't a morality so much in your good or bad intentions. What about the Greeks? Well, they was triple crazy about augury, right? The Greek higher species did all kinds of entrail readings. They loved them some entrails, and they loved reading the liver of all types of mammals. At the Oracle of Zeus, if a person wanted to consult the gods, 
they wrote a question on a tablet and they gave it to the oracle, the priests of the oracle, and those priests would ask the question out loud while reading the rustle of oak leaves belonging to a nearby sacred tree. Do you notice something? <laughs> Nobody's standing around in Rome and Greece with bated breath asking about your intention, your opinion on what to do next. Like your little thought process about next steps is, well, I think we should be careful though. We don't, we don't, we really want to move forward on this, but be careful because our good intentions could, could end very badly. What? That's not really that important. Your little thought process about next steps isn't being honored in the old world. We love our intentions. We imagine that if we just think about them a lot, we can figure out the right way to go. But our arguments seem kind of weak sauce once the entrails have been read. That's the old world. You know how I know? I've seen it in my own face with my own eyes. Yeah. I once sort of sat out, but I was there, a, a Mayan augury service. For real, I was in Guatemala with some friends and their friends were visiting, our field workers. And those friends really wanted to meet with a lo local Mayan priestess. So me and my pal, who's actually still my pal, he's editing these, he's Andrew, man. Well, we were a little nervous about these guests and about their Mayan priestess party. And so we were like, their hosts, though, so we didn't want to just like, I'm out. So we sort of told the priestess, uh, we're going to go over here a little bit. And then these guests went all in on the, on the service. The priestess was cool. She's like, yeah, I don't know why you'd be involved with this. It's fine. Right? Now, what we learned is she was using the concept of possession. So she asked our guests for a bunch of stuff, like their shoes, um, a Coke bottle that they were drinking from, or maybe an old ring, right? And our guests brought those things with them. And then that with some other things, the priestess put into a pile and, and arranged these things very particularly. And then she began to prepare a fire and thou, those things were being burnt, right? And so they put a beer can in there, I forget it. And they put all the shoes and they rolled up notes to their loved ones and they stuffed it all in this pile and then it got burned. And then it was really interesting watching, she was singing chants over the, the burning fire and prayers and, you know, whatever. Well, that's what she was doing, singing and praying. And, and Andrew and I are like backing off a little bit more. I just didn't want to get, I, I'm not about that, man. I don't even go to like, I don't even go to Protestant churches. Like, I'm not going to go hang out in there. I love you, Protestant people that are my friends. I have a lot of them. I'm just not going to be like, kumbaya, we're all together. Believe me, we can all be together. But how about over at this table over here? I am just like that. So backing away, though, I could watch. And it was very interesting because once the fire had gone out, the items that had been possessed by the people who gave them, right? they were being read by the priestess. They were being sort of understood according to the nature of fire that had been laid to them. The possessed spirit of the person who had given them was now being understood in light of the fire that was, and this is a cool idea or not cool, the fire was exposing spiritual truths about these items. Mm-hmm. It was very similar activity in, in Mali when I lived there. And all of our guys see this stuff. There was a guy that would read the footprints of cockroaches. I know. It's true, though. You're like, does this guy believe that you could read the cockroach footprints and come to conclusions? This guy believes you could do that, yes. But what are, are they true conclusions, buddy? What are you doing here? I'm saying they have something to do with reality that I don't fully understand. And on that account, with the cockroach footprint reading, I'm out. Could be good, though. I don't know. Feels not good, but could be. So I think what I want to do here before we end is there's an underlying assumption 
among most ancient cultures, old world, that the forces governing events around us are not whimsical. They're not just riven with random chance. <sighs> ding, ding, ding. I won. Right? It's not a lottery. Uh, it's, well, those are rigged anyway. But you get my point. It's not random. There's an assumption in the old world that the spirits governing reality are expressing a plan, a law, a law of the universe, let's say. And then that plan has a root in a transcendent divinity of some sort. That is definitely a type of Christian cosmology as well. Now, it's just a matter of which spirits are at play and which plan they have. And I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you which spirits. I don't know. But I am a believer in Orthodox Christianity, so I'm sticking with those. But anyway, that's why in the old world, discerning is the key. Yeah, your intentions matter a lot. A lot, a lot. Here's a really, really fun, heavy things, lightly pod fact. I just made that term up. Pod fact. The pagans, uh, watch this. Sorry, I mean the deists. The deists of the Enlightenment. Here, Tom Jefferson here, if you'd like. Benjamin Franklin. They had a similar understanding of the world around them. They believed that there were underlying laws that governed all the events around us. Those laws were to be augured. They were just like the laws of religious dummies before them. The difference was, ready? The method of auguring was, quote, scientific. That's not really the best word. Here's the best word. It was rational. Math. The method was not burning a bunch of shoes, or looking for cockroach footprints. The method was math. It was reason. It was, right, science. And little newsflash, that excludes prayer. You don't get to do that one thing, auger all the good things with science, and also be like, and I do a little prayer on the side. Let me say that again. Prayer was not in the plan of the deists or of the new atheists or of any atheists. Okay. Okay. Krista cans out there, Christian American political nationalist Christians tend to be Protestants. Okay. You know, the folks in Congress that say they're defending America because they are Christian. Like those folks who think Christianity and Americananity are the same thing. Like ready, ready. Prayer is like reading cockroach footprints. Okay, I'll say it one more time. Your little prayer to Jesus for those people, for the light people, is in the same category as reading cockroach footprints or the burning pattern of a beer can. For those people, your prayer is re you know, talking to God, prayer, talking to God, relating, communing, say, let's say even at a cup filled with like, let's say his body and blood. For the deists and the atheists and modern society, that's pretty much the same as reading a large heifer's large intestine. I've even had super duper Christians, quote, super duper Christians tell me, how can you eat that stuff from the same chalice as all the other people? Ugh. Yeah. I know. Now, Krista Cans, you got lumped in with the intestine readers. Yeah. The problem is, is that was a lot of pressure on American Protestants and on Western Protestants. Science kept making stuff happen. Like, oh my God, somebody's flying in the air? Who did that? Did God do that? Science did that. Oh, what does that mean for me? What happened was it meant that step by step, month by month, year by year, as the scientists began to control culture, the scientists were putting sometimes pur purposeful pressure on all these dumb Christian ideas. And guess what happened to all the Christians that used to believe in the magical, mystical things? They went bye-bye. Bye-bye communion. Bye-bye. Bye-bye communion. Why would we do that? We don't do cockroach footprints, okay? And one by one, all the mysteries of what we call reality were taken away because science kept proving itself to be, quote, true. Here's the good news, though. There really aren't that many true 
and right believing light people priests. I'll say that again. There aren't really that many true believing light people. Most light people are just like most Christicans and most Christians, actually. They're half good at true belief. Like good science believing atheists, uh, they're probably half good at it. If they're all the way good at it, they either kill themselves or kill a lot of other people. That's how it works. I'm talking about if they're true believers. If you're a true, 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 true believer in Christ, then you get killed. That's how it works. Someone's going to get really irritated with you, first of all. They're going to come to your monastery. They're, they're, you're going to become an irritant at some point to the really true, 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 true believing atheists. Here's the good news. Most of us are just in the middle, just eating chocolate. So don't get mad at me, people. Light people and crystal cans, they mostly just worry about paying the bills. But don't get it twisted. The priests of the light people and the priests of the crystal cans are real. They do exist. They're often on TV and they're locked in a secular death match that sucks. Okay. You can see it in the political arena. Most of us, though, just aren't those priestly types. The all-in people. But what's that got to do with my podcast? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, it's just to say this before we end this episode. In our spiritual lives, in the many other aspects of our lives, we focus on the outcome of things. We want to see results. We fall easily into this kind of reasoning. Here's what it sounds like. Here's what the reasoning sounds like. The thing that has been built into our world by light people and this phrase, good intentions are the road to hell. Here's the reasoning that I want us all to reject. It sounds like this. If you give money to that homeless guy, you might end up just making him more drunk and irresponsible, buddy. Use your head, young man. Buy him a meal instead. Be rational. Think ahead a little. Understand now that you could carve out a proper outcome if you just use your brain, buddy. You know, the road to hell is often paved with good intentions. That kind of world, that, that kind of word salad, it comes from the mind of light people, okay? Light people, reason worshipers. It comes from the priests of science, the priests who think that control is possible. Just think about it a little bit more. You get everything lined up. The same people who have given us the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, that's physics girls, place of pilgrimage, the largest particle physics laboratory in the world, $270 trillion worth of it. That place, the favorite place of light people, the, the Hanging Gardens, Physics Girls Pilgrimage Place. Deep down, the goal there is to get it exactly right. Tower of Babel. Yeah. Old school Christianity and the culture of Christ, that they tell us that outcomes are not nearly as important as the intentions behind them. This is not to say that outcome is unimportant. However, the outcome is determined by God. The intention, the zeal for the good, that's determined by his creatures. Where are the creatures? We just try to point in the right direction and do stuff. We don't control outcomes. We don't have that capability. We can't fix that. We, we are not that person. Where are the creatures? In our little creaturely lives, we should focus less on getting things right and avoiding bad outcomes and focus more on the courage and the willingness to just do God's will. Like, do the good. Have good intentions. Ah, courage to just do good. Like, you're going to lose your 401k. Correct. Continue to do the good. Children's lives, the outcomes of our careers, the future of our property values, our dreams, I've got dreams for the future. All that stuff is just not on us. In the old world, the gods do that part. We just line up in right order and we do what is right in front of us. It's pleasing. Do the good. All right. I think I'm supposed to get a blessing to say things that sound religious, of which, of course, is ridiculous. I just want to say that. Because whether I'm talking in front of 3,000 people, 300 people, three people, at some point I can mislead everybody all at the same time. And three people might be even worse than 3,000 people. Because I might be misleading just a perfect little soul that goes and changes the world for the bad. 
I'm trying to say what I believe is true with a loving, beautiful heart. And that's all I can do, whether it's 3,000 or 3 billion. Much love next time. This is going to be good. Next time we look at how the 20 largest, most expensive projects of the last 400 years all share something uniquely frightening and deeply informative when it comes to finding the fastest road to hell. Spoiler alert, there's going to be a big tower involved and a particle accelerator and an apple and a snake and a thing that costs $2,700 trillion. I'm not making that up. Next time, the 20 largest, most expensive projects in the world and how they fit into the concept of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Peace out. Much love to you guys.